the abstractions of complexity with actually making a difference in people's life and actually changing the way that you shuffle around money in society and look at outcomes. So it's been a long time coming and thank you very much. Grant. Take it away. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Back, yes. Uh, um, so quick, uh, just trying to get a sense of who's in the room. How many of you are complexity people? Show of hands. Okay. And uh, how many of you are public management people? Nobody? Excellent. I can blag that completely then. And ha ha did anyone just wander into the wrong, wrong room or in need of a sit down? No. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Daniel. My name's uh, Toby Lowe. I'm a, a researcher at uh, Newcastle University Business School. And I'm going to talk with you for about an hour today on this idea of uh, complexity and public management. I'm going to contextualise stuff a little bit for you, talk about how I came to be talking about this kind of stuff. Um, because I anticipated that there might not be uh, so many public management people in the room, I'll give you a very qu a quick 101 on what the discipline of public management is and particularly my take on it. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the ideas of complexity in public management and compare and contrast that to uh, what, we what I call a rationalist public management paradigm and, how, and look a little bit about how I think complexity as a, as a set of ideas undermines uh, the ra this rationalist paradigm. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what um, a complexity-informed public management paradigm looks like in practice. Uh, because one of the things about my journey is that kind of being, thinking of myself as an academic is a bit of an unsettling recategorization for me because until three and a little bit years ago, I was a uh, manager in the not-for-profit and public sector in the UK. So, and for the last uh, eight years of that, I was head of program and then um, a chief executive of a, of a charity in, in the UK. And so I come at this business of public management and particularly questions of performance management from a practitioner perspective. I got into this business because I was frustrated with how performance management in the public sector and voluntary sectors was done in the UK. And it, 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 I was so frustrated that I thought, what's, what's the opportunity to change this? Can we do some research that looks at different ways of thinking about resource allocation and performance management? And all around this core question, how can we plan and performance manage social interventions better? So if you have resources to distribute to achieve social good, and you have a set of people who want to do social good, how can those th two things be matched up in the most effective way, in the way that produces the greatest purposeful social impact? So that's, that's the kind of journey that I've been on. Um, public Management 101. Public management is, uh, so in the US, this is, there's the same discipline is sometimes called public administration. It's basically the same thing. And it's a discipline which studies the process of developing and implementing public policy um, and the delivery of public services, but also shading into um, the activity of not-for-profit organisations and therefore also the activity of philanthropists in that whole broader world. And my particular topic within this kind of broad stuff about public management is about public sector performance management. So repeating this question, how can social interventions be more effective? How can resources be allocated and people's work be directed in a way that achieves maximum impact? Can you repeat the question? Uh, please. So I'm curious of whether you talk about developing public policy includes legislation. Yes, so uh, at the um, uh, end, one end of the public management spectrum is those people developing uh, new laws and uh, as a discipline, it, that's where it shades into political science. So there's a kind of like a, a nice little grey area between those two disciplines. Um, the, the bit that I'm looking at is not about the creation of new law uh, and the creation of new legislation. It's about the implementation of it. So when people decide this is how stuff should be done, th this is what needs to happen, how is that enacted in, uh, in the world? Oh, and uh, the, since we've had a nice example of this, if, uh, if anyone has a question at any point, do raise your hand, shout, otherwise make noise. Um, and so this is the current way that people think about how to 
performance manage the um, uh, social interventions right now, uh, whether that's in a public or a, a, a charitable sector uh, context. Uh, and we call this outcome-based performance management. It has many different names, kind of results-based management, uh, also known as results-based accountability, payment by results or payment by, by success. And in a philanthropic world, it's often called strategic or outcome-based philanthropy. Basically, it's the idea that um, those in charge should define what good looks like, define success by setting particular outcomes for organisations. So uh, we, want their, we want fewer people to be obese. That's the desired outcome. And then only paying those organisations who are do, delivering work in that field if those outcomes are achieved. So a specific outcome is selected and resources are allocated if organisations achieve that, that goal or goals. No, absolutely, and one of, the, one of the key shifts, I think, from a complexity-informed uh, perspective is absolutely those people who have that kind of authority viewing themselves as part of the system or having specific roles in helping those systems to organise effectively. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so those, the quality of those kind of relationships and the effective communication between them is crucial for uh, this stuff going forward. So uh, this is an example of that kind of outcomes-based uh, performance management in practice. So this is a, um, uh, a slide taken from a presentation by one of the local authorities in the UK, Rochdale, and it's trying to, uh, it's uh, describing its um, uh, obesity reduction uh, objectives. So it's saying, uh, in a particular part of this, uh, of Rochdale in the UK, we want to reduce the level of obesity by 20%. And what that means, so in order to uh, operationalise that, we, may, we need to take the idea of obesity and turn it into something measurable. So they use body mass index, BMI, as a way to measure that and say, okay, we want... Uh, to uh, reduce the, uh, B uh, the overweight population, so people with a BMI measure a score of between 26 and 30, from 56% of the population to 45% of the population. That's a lot of overweight people. Uh, and we want to um, uh, reduce the uh, obese population from 20% to 16%. So you can see the way in which public policy is expressing its ideas in terms of this achievement of particular outcomes. The other idea, a kind of core ideas to this way, the, this way of thinking is that outcomes are produced by... Mm -hmm. How do they choose which uh, specific ones? Good question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most of the time, seemingly at random. Or 20% 20. 20 sounds like a good amount of reduction, right? Let's, let's, let's go for 20%. The, the policy discussions I've ever been part of around this, there's no, that people aren't introducing evidence into why 20% and not 10% or there'll be a big tipping point if we achieve blah, blah, blah. 20% sounds achievable, right? Or like 15%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the, other, the other things that do occur in these conversations are people look at historical, to be, to be less unkind, uh, people look at historical trends and say, okay, it's, this is the pattern over time so far. If we intervene, what can we get it to? Blah, 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 blah. Like this, this is 
fact that you have to be presented like this is actually very political point in creating a threshold insofar as like what it is that you know how would you actually know if you actually even have a threshold at all? Exactly. So thank you. This is where so th this is the way that this stuff is done at the moment. What I think is that complexity offers a critique to all of this approach. So this is where, this is the direction of travel for this presentation. Um, and you can begin to see why complexity offers a critique of those kind of approaches when you see the way in which this stuff is rendered visual. Through. So this is uh, um, the way in which outcomes are conceived to be created under this kind of system. So it's a linear process of change that starts from the input resources of an organisation, so it's money, it's buildings, it's people, it's blah, blah, blah. And those resources are used to run a programme process, so if we're thinking about obesity, that might be weight loss clinics or uh, healthy eating uh, uh, seminars, or this is a, how you prepare a, a nutritious meal. That gives you a particular set of outputs for the programme. Oh, we ran 50 of these seminars and 25 of those workshops and blah, blah, blah. And that will lead to short-term outcomes being achieved, long-term outcomes being achieved. So this, it, what they call program logic model, is from um, literally the, the textbook on this, measuring outcomes and managing for results. So this is how people who are uh, thinking within this paradigm conceive of how an outcome is made. So that is a whistle-stop and stupidly generalised version of uh, what public management looks like right now and uh, a bit of the normative of how it should be done. Um, what I want to say is that there are, uh, th and myself and colleagues at Newcastle have been uh, developing the idea that there's four aspects of complexity that really challenge, that offer a challenge to that way of thinking about how public management should be done. And one of the things I'm keen to get feedback from you guys on is whether these four aspects of complexity make sense to you as people who are in, in the complexity stuff deep. So how many of you are familiar with this diagram? It's, one, it's my favourite diagram in the world. <laughs> it's a systems map of obesity produced by the UK government in 2007. It's a causal loop diagram. They tried to map the 108 different factors that they say that uh, they were able to identify as uh, being a contributing factor to whether people were obese or not, and they tried to map all the relationships between those 108 different factors. So like causal yep, or? yep. Uh, and so, the, the this was a kind of I love this piece of work, not because this is a particularly useful diagram for enabling people to go, okay, if we want to tackle obesity, then we should do this because. Oh my God. But what it demonstrates is <coughs> the complexity behind how an outcome is made. So this is beginning to delve into the idea that an outcome is an emergent process of a complex system. Right? So, and compare it to this version of how an outcome is made. Right? So we can, we can begin to see, we can start to see how complexity becomes relevant to this uh, uh, public policy. Um, so the first aspect of complexity that I think this demonstrates is something we call comp compositional complexity. An outcome is made of the interactions of hundreds of different factors all working together in emergent ways. So the first aspect. And then there's a, a second aspect of complexity that we call experiential complexity in that this is a kind of aggregate causal loop diagram for, for the general population. Actually, if we want to think about how to tackle obesity for me, I've got a map that will be different to my colleagues. Each one of us will have a set of factors where, whereby that causal loop diagram will be different. So, experiential complexity speaking to the inherent subjectivity of uh, our experience of outcomes and the way that the outcomes are made for each one of us differently. <coughs> and then thirdly, dynamic complexity. This is my colleague made a moving picture. I'm so happy with him. Um, uh, I'm not really a diagrams person, but he, he did this. Um, so these causal loop diagrams are kind of overly static representations of how an outcome like obesity is made. Actually, 
these the, the, the causal relationships and the relationships between the factors are in flux over time, right? So, uh, just when we think we have a handle on how the, an outcome like obesity is made for a particular person or set of people, th things change. And finally, um, governance complexity. So, the, the public management previously has been kind of predicated on a hierarchical control concept. That there are people in a system or above a system who, are, who, are, who control its levers. They are the people that, uh, if they do stuff, this will happen. And you can see that thinking in that linear process of change diagram before, right? But we now know that the uh, social interventions, uh, the interventions that might help someone tackle obesity in their lives, they're only very partly to do with the activities of a public sector uh, worker or a, a politician. There will be a whole range of non-profit organisations involved in their lives. There will be a whole range of private sector organisations involved in their lives. Um, there will be uh, civil society and their families and their friend networks, most of which are outside the control or influence of those seeking to uh, produce outcomes from a, a public management perspective. So, these four aspects of complexity we think offer a significant challenge to the dominant paradigm within public management. Compositional complexity, experiential complexity, dynamic complexity and governance complexity. So I'll return to what I think the implications of those are and the, or the way in which public management needs to meet those challenges in a, uh, as we go on. So, the question, that <coughs> question. the question that I'm asking, therefore, is can complexity provide an alternative set of explanatory ideas which challenges that existing way of doing things within public management? And can it give us a platform for a more normative approach to public management? The ability to, to look at public management practice and say, no, you shouldn't do it like that. Because... I think that complexity does offer that kind of platform because we can say, if, the world, if we agree that the world is complex and therefore operates like this, it suggests that we have these kind, should have these kind of practices rather than those. And that's a very different stance for a public management uh, discipline, which has mainly been in the kind of classic social science mode of, oh, let's go over there and see what these people do. It's not, it's not traditionally been a normative discipline. So, <coughs> I'm thinking here about the idea of paradigm shift. So, can complexity give us an alternative paradigm for public management? And I didn't want to assume that everyone would know what I was talking about when I was talking about paradigms, because uh, when I speak to different audiences, they're di generally a mixture of academic and practitioner audiences, and I'm told repeatedly that I shouldn't talk about paradigms for practitioner audiences, because every time I say the word paradigm, someone falls asleep. Uh, but but I, think, I think the idea of paradigms are really important in understanding this. So, I, I'm sure I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know, but a paradigm... Cl going back to the classic Thomas Kuhn definition, practices that define a scientific discipline at a certain point in time. So one thing, I'm stretching this idea of kind of scientific disciplines into both public management as an academic discipline and public management as a practice. Thomas Kuhn would have frowned on that. But we know that a, parag a paradigm dictates the kinds of questions that are asked, um, what is observed, how the questions are formulated, how the resu results are inter interpreted, how the research is carried out, blah, 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 all that. It is an entire way of framing a set of questions for a discipline. Right? It almost defines what is seen and what is not, what counts and what doesn't count. <coughs> and Margaret Masterman delved into this idea of uh, the kind of Kuhnian paradigm um, a little bit further and usefully, I think. So she said there's a metaphysical level for each paradigm, so a set of uh, core ideas and the relationship between those. There is a sociological level for each paradigm, the languages and practices by which they are understood and enacted. So codes of practice and uh, the way that a particular set of practitioners begin to speak a particular language that is special to them. And then there's a set of exemplars, so how these uh, demonstrations of how these ideas and the practices solve problem X. So demonstration of value to particular communities of, pra of practitioners. 
So if paradigms have all of these things, what does, this, what does the current paradigm for public management look like? Well, at a metaphysical level, we suggest that um, it's, uh, it's got a reductionist worldview. Essentially, if it exists, let's chop it up smaller and see what the smallest bit of it if it exists. Uh, an epistemology of positivist empiricism, that the world is out there to know, independent of us, and we really only know it if we observe it. And significantly, has a has a set of behavioural assumptions about rational self-interest and the, ne the necessity of extrinsic motivation underpinning uh, this uh, paradigm. And it has a governance assumption about the necessity of hierarchical authority and control. So those are the th the, what we think are the core ideas of uh, the rationalist paradigm for public management. And then it has a set of practices by which it's enacted. Um, the first of these is abstraction. So in order to define success, you need to, turn, you need to abstract from the, um, the messy reality of the world and turn that into something measurable. So we saw that in the obesity example, right? So success moves from um, uh, uh, a general idea about reduction in obesity to very specific measurements. Um, a then we see processes of disaggregation. So what are the, what, what, how can we break down the, uh, our goal of fewer obese people into particular definable and measurable steps? And that represents, is represented nicely in the kind of causal chain that we saw before. And then there are processes of attribution. Who should we reward and punish for the success or failure of this? Because what we want to know is which of, the, of all the, in the marketplace of uh, ideas and projects and interventions, which of these are the really successful ones to tackle obesity? Let's give more money to them and let's punish the others. Um, and so you, begin, you see this an exemplar in the funding and commissioning of social interventions. So the problem that is trying to be solved is how do we distribute resources effectively to achieve social good? This is what this rationalist paradigm is saying. We've got the answer to this, we nailed it. And you see it in these uh, things. So these are, uh, I'm gonna show you various diagrams about the commissioning cycle. How pub people who uh, are in charge of implementing public policy then distribute the resources. So, What's the, they do a needs analysis. What are the needs of the particular set of people we're trying to serve? So if this, again, is re, uh, reducing, uh, about reducing obesity, what's the food um, uh, availability? What's the access to exercise? What's the transport? Blah, 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 blah. Then they do kind of a development of markets because, uh, again, think about the behavioralist assumption of uh, rational self-interest. What we need is a marketplace of projects who will uh, meet these needs. Then we do a competitive tendering exercise that gives a contract for an organisation or organisation to deliver services. And then at the end of this process, we review and evaluate and attempt to learn and improve. Uh, if the people doing it have done well, we give them more money. If the people doing it haven't done well, we stop their money and we give it to somebody else. And you can see this commissioning cycle everywhere. So that was, uh, uh, this one was from the National Council of Voluntary Organisations in the UK. This is from a local NHS provider. You see exactly the same set of stages going on. Uh, this is uh, the national NHS commissioning cycle. And so you begin to see this sociological level of this rationalist paradigm emerging. This is what you do if you want to do world-class commissioning. Again, all the same set of ideas. <coughs> so, different wheel now. How do paradigms change? Um, so paradigms change according to the classic Kuhnian thing when the um, experiments that people are doing week to week, day to day, throw up anomalous uh, data that can't be explained by the dominant paradigm. Right? And they say that this... Um, uh, uh, results in a process of that paradigm becoming more and more complex, they're getting more and more subclauses, or in order to explain this, it, then we, this we, we, had to do, we have to create this sub-law onto the side of our main law and blah, 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 until the paradigm eats itself. In the social world, the equivalent of uh, that experimental, anomalous experimental data is people's day-to-day -day experiences. So the experiences of people trying to do public management and their... their uh, 
uh, experience of whether these, those funding cycle processes work and produce the results that are promised, we now see a bunch of people going, hang on a minute, I've, I've done, I did, I did it all right, I did everything about the World Coast Commissioning, but still we've got a whole bunch of obese people in our neighbourhood, still there's significant crime, still there's, this isn't working. So that, I think, is the equivalent of the anomalous uh, d uh, experimental data in the social world. And it's creating this opportunity for crisis, which leads to the opportunity for change in paradigm, change in worldview. Because <coughs> I think our current paradigm is broken. And I think we see the evidence of this everywhere. So people have done a whole bunch of research studies about what happens when people implement the kind of outcome-based performance management paradigm that I introduced at the start. Um, I could like stand on a stack of studies this high. I'll just let you read that. <laughs> well, that's a bit damning, right? The journey is long and the results are disappointing. Uh, targets for, setting targets for results frequently distorts the direction of programs, diverting attention away from rather than towards what the program should be doing. Oops. Uh, that form of performance management results in ossification, a lack of innovation, tunnel vision and sub-optimization. None of those sound like very good words. And it doesn't matter where the implementation of this is studied or in which kind of policy area, results are pretty much the same. And the latest evidence, they did a systematic review uh, of the Australian government's outcomes-based contracting. So it turns out that if you set outcomes-based contracts, people deliver on those but that's not actually what the people want, and everything else gets worse or stagnates. So, evidence that the current paradigm is failing, I think. And why does it fail, or what happens as a result of it failing is because it's turning everyone's job into the production of good-looking data rather than meeting client need. I could go into this more if, if, if this is interesting, but I'm going to skip over this for now. Um, uh, I'm going to explain why the current paradigm fails. So there's two, there's two key flaws, I think, that are inherent to this paradigm. Firstly, um, uh, there's a measurement problem, that when we say that we're measuring impact in the world, we're not. We're measuring what's measurable and calling that impact. So um, the, the way that we can represent this is that there is a necessary gap between what is measurable the proxy measure, and the experience of an outcome that I, as a person on the end of all this social intervention, feel in the world. So an, uh, an outcome like well-being, my experience of that outcome will be very different to what's measurable. But if what's measurable is used as a performance target driving that organisation, what they'll do, what they'll focus on, is what's measurable, not what's important to me. And if we want to see the kind of the classic example of this recently, we can look outside the public sector. Um, uh, who remembers VW Dieselgate from the last couple of years? <laughs> right? What happened there? Well, we had an experience of, of a desired outcome that we wanted, less diesel pollution in the world for the, uh, from the engines that are driving around. But that, that's quite difficult to measure as those engines are driving around. That's because you've got to attach things to them and blah, blah, blah. So we'll do a proxy measure. How do those engines perform in a laboratory envi environment? And that's a pretty, that would, you would think that's a pretty decent proxy measure, right? That's good standing in for that. How, so the gap between what's measurable and what's the, the experience of the outcome in the world should be quite small. What distorting effect can that possibly have? Well, it turns out that we've, the distorting effect was to waste thousands and thousands and thousands of human hours of engineering time and uh, intelligence on making engines that performed well in labs rather than putting, uh, stopping pollution being put out into the world. And if that happens with something as simple and straightforward as the performance of diesel engines, where there's pretty straightforward, causal, simple causal chains, right? If, that, if we get the distorting effects of targets in that kind of context, imagine the distorting effects of those outcome targets in complex social environments. So, when we talk about outcome measurement, actually what we're doing is trying to fit the complexity of human life 
into a little box that's marked what's measurable. See this visually represented. So that's the first problem. There's a measurement problem. That when we say we're measuring impact, we're not. We're measuring what's measurable and calling that impact. There's a second problem, which is an attribution problem, in that interventions don't create outcomes. Systems create outcomes. This is, remember, so this is the logic of how they think outcomes are made. An intervention makes an outcome. Ding, 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 ding. We know that this is a bit more like how an outcome is made. And what happens, then, if you try and um, uh, use an outcomes-based accountability approach for this, the whole system is responsible for whether people are obese or not. Food production, you can't see the individual factors, but they can be summed up into areas like food production and supply, macroeconomic drivers, education, the media, technology, nature at work, the built environment. Down here in the bottom right-hand corner, four out of the 108 factors, healthcare and treatment options. These are the things that we would tend to fund as public bodies or as charitable foundations in order to tackle obesity. And if we try and use an outcomes-based performance management model on this, Basically, what we're saying is we're holding you accountable here in the system for the behaviour of the system as a whole. What that means is we're holding you accountable for things you don't control. And if people are held accountable for things they don't control, they learn to manage what they can control, which is the production of data. Which is why outcome-based performance management always creates drivers for gaming, because the only rational response if you're a deliverer of services and you're being held accountable for things you don't control, is to try and make the data look better. Because that you can control. So you creep and you park. You uh, teach the test. You, um, <coughs> um, uh, if all else fails, you just make stuff up. And I, you know, like I say, we can dig into this further if you like. The evidence is everywhere. So if that's the way that complexity challenges this, this current paradigm, what else can we do? And the, so the conversations that I'm having with practitioners and with academics uh, in the UK and elsewhere now is to say, we need to embrace the complexity of the work. And so there's an academic view on that, which I'm uh, going to start with. What does embracing the complexity of the work mean from a kind of public ma academic public management perspective? So remember, these were the things that we had to respond to. Compositional complexity, dynamic complexity, experiential complexity, governance complexity. Outcomes are made by lots of different things and the relationship between those things are always changing and the outcome is different for each person and no one's in control. So how can we respond from a, a public management perspective? Well the first thing we can say is that our strategy must be provisional and emergent because if if we take the complexity stuff seriously, then it massively resists our ability to create predictive models for how interventions will work. We can't start with a set of strategic thinking done by the expensive brains at the top of an organisation and just enact that down the organisation through performance management. But because by the, even if for some miracle those expensive brains got everything exactly right about how that system worked, by the time it's been enacted down through the organisation, that strategy bill will be at least a little bit wrong. So, strategy must be provisional and emergent, and we must give people the opportunity to learn through feedback mechanisms, creating rapid feedback loops that um, uh, create the opportunity for changing course. And we need to be, in order to enable this learning, we need to be open to talking about failure. So there, there's a beautiful expression about creating positive error cultures. So creating an atmosphere, a culture uh, within an organisation where talking about failures and mistakes is seen as the norm. And we can kind of sum all this stuff up in relatively straightforward terms. We can't reliably predict what the outcome of our uh, interventions will be, so let's try stuff and see what happens. That becomes the attitude to strategy that public management seems to require if it's going to take this complexity stuff seriously, the causal and dynamic elements. Experiential complexity requires a slightly different thing. So let's think about Ashby's law of requisite variety. We need to meet the, the complexity of, dem of demand out there with our capacity to respond to that uh, variation in that demand. This suggests that uh, the appropriate strategy is to devolve decision-making about who gets what and how 
to the very front line. So the organisations working in human services, for example, <laughs> oh, indeed, the, um, this is a massive simplification and because it's not that the, um, uh, our previous knowledge about what has worked and what hasn't in the past is useless, but it's information to inform judgment, it doesn't tell us what to do. And so stuff that's worked in a previous context, in a previous time, might be applicable in our context. And if you're going to start with, okay, what stuff should we try first? Yeah, that's, why not, why not start with stuff that's worked elsewhere? But the idea, but you can't simply say, okay, let's take the plan that, we, that they used over there and drop it into our context and expect it to work. Because the contingent factors associated with that system w won't be present in yours. So you can't use that as the basis of a, structure, a rigid and structured plan in the way that the management would, uh, inc like a, a project management approach would encourage uh, us to take. We need to try stuff and see what happens. But yes, we can't, we shouldn't just be, let's try that <laughs> at random. Unless you really don't know what's going on. <laughs> so, uh, blah, 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 blah. So, um, the, to meet the, experiment, the experiential complexity, we need to respond to the variation in demand that, uh, that uh, is experienced in the system. And that means enabling those at the front line to create bespoke public po policy responses for each person or community that they're engaging with. Because the needs and strengths of each of those people or communities will be different and the only people who know the needs and strengths of those communities or people are those who have a relationship with them. So this suggests that experiential complexity requires devol devolving decisions to the front line. Decisions about how to respond to need can't be made at the top of organisations. Producing programmatic responses is the wrong approach in complexity. So we need to give the front line the space and resources to create bespoke social policy interventions. In the past, this has been thought of as the discretion of street-level bureaucrats to interpret policy differently. Maybe we can suggest that needs to go a little bit further. It's not about street-level bureaucrats interpreting policy differently. It's about them enabled to create bespoke policy responses for each person that they encounter. <coughs> And finally, we think governance complexity requires a sense of shared leadership, and particularly this idea of nurturing system health. So this is where it uh, begins to get into the points that I think that you were making, that um, if we think that uh, it's systems that produce through emergent activity the outcomes that we're interested in, then the quality of relationships between the actors in systems, their ability to coordinate, their ability to share information effectively, that becomes a crucial part of whether that system will produce positive outcomes or not. And there's a role for um, uh, out, uh, talking about outcomes in all of this because they become ralliers of common shared purpose across the system. So, I wanted to say that these are the ways in which a complexity-informed paradigm seems to suggest an alternative normative approach for public management. I want to introduce one other idea into, uh, for how we can think about um, the role of public managers differently. Um, that it was at the bottom of the page. The Safari one? Yeah, just it, bring up the bar. Bring up the bar. Oh, yeah. Where it says yeah. Oh. So you just got to click where it's not the, um, the, no, not the, not the type of bar part. Oh, uh, right. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Not a Mac user.
most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years. But the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park. And despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. That, I'm just gonna pause it. Sorry, George. Um, <laughs> it was this idea of ecosystem engineers. The first time I heard that, I thought, oh, that's a set of language that is completely alien to the world of public management, is there something useful about that idea that we can transport into a public management space? And the dams they built in the rivers uh, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. Now, I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with that film from, or the, sorry, familiar with that example from your studies in various ways. But so I'm, in, and I'm particularly interested in talking with you guys as complexity, uh, people who de delve deeply into complexity, about how transferable that idea of ecosystem engineers might be into a public management space. Um, I want to do one other thing by way of... Oh, not by way of that. Uh, by way of exploring some of these key ideas about how we can respond. Um, and to do that, I'm going to ask you to come outside with me. Hello. Uh, a bunch of people started talking about relationships and trust. And we thought, oh, that's interesting. 
so that we did a follow-up set, uh, set of questions with people. How do you use relationships and trust to respond to complexity? And the findings of that we put into this report. So um, we were able to use that kind of the academic context to reinterpret what people were saying to suggest that what we were finding was a complexity, a new complexity-informed approach to the challenges of public management. And the key changes that those organisations seem to be enacting were a different attitude towards the motivation of the people involved, using learning as the engine for performance improvement rather than accountability, and a change in attitude to um, whose job it was to look after the health of the systems as a whole. And I'll dig into those, each of those three uh, key areas of change briefly for you now. So the key shift in motivation that, that, people were th uh, that people described was that they said that we assume that the people doing the work, the people that we fund, the people who uh, we manage, if it's in a public context, their motivation to do the human services work or whatever is intrinsic, not extrinsic. So they don't need reward and punishment in order to focus them on doing a good job. And it's interesting because that fits with a bunch of actual research material about what people, how people say they're motivated in that work, but also a bunch of research material that says um, if you try and extrinsically motivate people who are intrinsically motivated, all you get is a crowding out of intrinsic motivation. Right? So it's, this was a really interesting set of responses to us, partly because it fitted with a bunch of other evidence, but because it unlocked a key change. Because if you don't think that people need reward and punishment in order to do a good job, then it unlocks the idea that it's learning that's the engine for performance improvement rather than vertical accountability. So what these folks said is, we try and create learning environments around the people that uh, do this work. They tr we try and create what they call positive error cultures. So cultures where, in, within organisations, within sectors, we're talking about mistakes and uncertainty is viewed as a good thing, just what we do around here. Because think back to that spaghetti complexity, uh, obesity diagram. If you're making decisions every day in situations of uncertainty, you're making decisions where you can't know what the outcome of your judgment will be. And that means, of necessity, some of those judgments will be wrong, and you're very likely to feel uncertain about what the right thing to do is. And so if the only thing you can guarantee is that of, of your workforce, they will be making wrong judgments, you need to get, have the ability for people to talk about those mistakes and uncertainty. Otherwise, how does everyone's judgment get any better? So, creation of positive error culture was really important. There are people were describing opportunities to create peer-based group reflection on practice. And there's also a role for measurement in all of this. Because measure, but measurement for learning rather than for accountability. Because there's really... Um, uh, people get very het up about the question, what should we measure? And it's an important question, but it's actually a secondary question to why are we measuring? And if you make the why are we measuring if, to learn and improve, then that's a great reason to measure. If you make the why are we measuring in order to make ourselves accountable to others, in order to demonstrate success to others, all the evidence says that creates uh, uh, the conditions for gaming. So there's a thing called um, Goodhart's Law, uh, was president of the Bank of England in the 70s, it says any target, that be, so any metric that becomes a target ceases to be a good metric. Right? And there's a, <coughs> uh, uh, a slightly more academic version of that called Campbell's Law, uh, I need to take a drink of water before trying this. <coughs> Campbell's Law. Any quantitative indicator used for the purposes of social decision making will tend to corrupt and distort the processes it is intended to monitor. So, use measurement for learning, not for accountability. That's what these people said they were doing. And finally, they said... Um, our job as funders and commissioners is to take responsibility for the health of the system as a whole. And so we, later I began to think about this idea of ecosystem engineers as a way to describe this role. So the funders and commissioners who uh, think this way, they're changing the purpose of their job. They're no longer saying, my job is to purchase the services that deliver the good outcomes. They say, 
my job is to create the healthy ecosystem from which good outcomes emerge. And they say they did that, so what, what did they do? What did they mean by saying that? They said, we invest in networks, so uh, mechanisms for actors within the system to collaborate effectively. And there's a kind of technical aspect to that, like so building the infrastructure for people to meet, enabling people to have the information sharing technology that enables people to coordinate effectively. There's technical aspects to that. But there's also an emotional aspect to this, nurturing the trust between actors in the system that enables them to tell each other the truth about what the works really like to do. So what does this look like in practice? So this is, again, from a funder's or commissioner's perspective. Um, processes of scoping and inquiry, processes of resource allocation, relationship management, and kind of crucially mo moving from monitoring to learning and evaluation. Now, I won't highlight all of those because I've taken too long. I'll just pick out some of these key processes. So people talked about relational funding, so funding for organisations based on a deep understanding of what that organisation does and the people involved. They talked about multi-year unrestricted funding. So uh, unrestricted funding in the technical sense of we're not telling you what you should do with this money as a funder to the grantee. Um, and the reason that seemed to be important was because um, if we take the idea of dynamic complexity seriously, if you're setting a set of funding conditions to your grantees, you're basically saying, we know everything about how the system works that, that you care about, and we are really confident that nothing about that system will change over time. That seems like a bit of a strange thing to say. So what the funders are saying is, we, we, tr we find the organisations we trust to do the right thing when the world changes, because the world is going to change. So what do they do? They invest in networks, they do workforce development, they, as I say, they move from monitoring to learning. Trust is a really key important point for this, because it's trust that provides the confidence to let go of the illusion of control. And we have in the room with us uh, John from the Women Institute, whose who's, uh, charitable foundation describe what they do as trust-based philanthropy. And what it seems to be saying, you can ask him this yourself, I trust the organisation to do the right thing when the world changes. So that a crucial aspect of this as a, uh, to, as a public management practice, then the question is, what's a good set of reasons for funders and fundees to trust one another? Because there are terrible sets of reasons why a funder and fundee must, might trust one another. Oh, I went to school with him, he's great. Oh, he's, they, they've got a really charismatic chief executive, she looks brilliant on the television. We trust her. No, there are terrible reasons for trust. For, so what are the good reasons? And this is some of the things that the funders who operated in this way said. We trust the organisations that collaborate well. We trust the organisations that know the roles within the systems in which they operate. We know how our stuff integrates with their stuff and matches with their stuff. Blah, blah, blah. They we trust the organisations that share and reflect on their practice with others, that are generous in talking about and reflecting on what they do. And we trust the organisations that use data intelligently to learn. So, to recap. To manage in complexity, we think you must be ecosystem engineers to recognise intrinsic motivation, find those you can trust to do the right thing when the world changes, but also nurture relationships of trust across the actors in the system. Use learning as your driver for performance improvement and to build networks and collaboration across those systems. For us, as a, a set of public management academics, our next step is we're doing a set of action research with organisations who are working in this way. So we've kind of basically looked at the organisations in the UK and our, who are operating us and say, who wants to be part of a research project where we look at create case studies for um, uh, to understand better how the detail of how to work in this way. And there's an initial cohort of eight organisations have said yes, uh, and so we're, we're working with them to, uh, to look at questions like how does accountability work under a complexity-informed paradigm? If you can't hold people or organisations accountable for producing particular results, accountability is still an important idea, so how does it work? We ask them what are good reasons to trust. We ask them what's required to create a learning environment. We ask them what's a healthy system look like and how do they know if they've got one? <coughs> And also, 
we're forming a community of practice for organisations who are working in this way to say, let, let, you guys can talk to each other about how to do the things. And we just, so we launched this in August this year. We've already got um, somewhere around 160 practitioners in the UK signed up. You don't have to be in the UK to sign up. It's, an op it's just a forum and a library of resources if you're interested in working this way. That's a set of other people who are also interested in the same stuff. Thanks for listening. <laughs>